Hi everyone, my name is Marie Lees and I'm from the University of Rhode Island's Inner Space Center. Right now I'm coming to you live from the main lab on board the research vessel Endeavour. We're currently located above the wreck of U-853 off the coast of Block Island. Joining me today is Dwight Coleman, the chief scientist on board and director of the Inner Space Center. He's going to give us some context as to what's going on here and also tell us a little of the history of the wreck. Great. Thanks, Maria Lee. So welcome, everybody. This is actually our final broadcast of nine broadcasts in partnership with uh, Rhode Island PBS. So we're quite happy to have uh, done these projects with Rhode Island PBS. It's been a, a great couple of days here this week uh, broadcasting live from the research and en vessel Endeavor. So I'm Dwight Coleman. I'm the director of the Space Center at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. And we're on board uh, URI's research vessel Endeavor. So we're off the coast of Block Island. And we're getting ready to launch an ROV on the boat, U-853, which is located off the coast of Block Island. So just to set the stage a little bit, um, this, we're, we're located uh, about six or seven miles off the coast of Block Island, pretty much due east from the tip of Block Island, and south of Point Judith area of Narragansett, Rhode Island. So uh, right off the Rhode Island coast. And little do people know that a major World War II sea battle occurred right here in these waters. So it's uh, very exciting to be using technology, oceanographic technology, to explore a shipwreck and to tell the story of the history of the Battle of Point Judith and the sinking of the U-853 and uh, this entire battle that took place uh, more than 70 years ago. So uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, there's a multidisciplinary team of scientists and engineers out here, including students and teachers from Rhode Island, and uh, mostly uh, URI-affiliated people, uh, including folks from the Graduate School of Oceanography and also the uh, Ocean Engineering Department, and that, they're our team. So Stephen Licht and his group, uh, including a couple of graduate students, Jordan and Matt, are on deck right now with Jessica, who's an intern from MIT, and they are actually preparing the RV for launch, and we're uh, actually going to dive the this ROV during this broadcast and hopefully get down on top of the U-boat uh, tonight. So we're uh, pretty excited to watch this action live as it unf unfolds uh, this evening. It's a beautiful night out there. We've had some technical challenges along the way. Uh, one thing that we're trying to do is use this technology to dive on uh, this shipwreck, but we're in coastal waters where there's a lot of current and there's a lot of uh, low visibility conditions under the sea. And that, um, that basically makes challenges for using this sort of technology. Perhaps scuba is the better technology to use to explore shipwrecks in shallow waters like this. So we've learned a lot by uh, trying to use this technology and get down to the shipwrecks, navigate um, the, the ship, the Endeavor, with its uh, lack of dynamic positioning. So it does not quite have the, the thrusters that we need to hold station that well. So when there's a strong current, we are challenged by the ability to station keep. So the, the captain and the mates on the bridge have done a fine job of keeping the ship steady, but we're doing what we call live boating. So we're not anchored. We have to uh, live boat, which means they're always driving the boat against the current and against the wind to keep us on station. So that's been one of the challenges. Another one of the challenges is the ROV itself. It's brand new uh, ROV technology. We haven't used it on this ship before. Uh, earlier in the week, we had some trouble with an electrical ground fault. And so fortunately, we've had the engineers um, that you're looking at now on deck uh, uh, do some diagnostics and basically secure that ground fault. Basically, a ground fault is an electrical problem that could occur if there's a small leak in one of the uh, sensors on the vehicle or some other electrical short that um, could prevent something from operating properly on the vehicle. So they've had to deal with that electrical uh, problem, and that's been another one of these challenges this week. So despite the challenges, we, we were able to get down on the wreck. Another challenge was that we had some poor weather yesterday, so we weren't able to work on the U-boat site. We had to go out to uh, the lee side of Block Island, on the west side of Block Island, and we actually did a dive successfully on a shipwreck called the Montana, which was a schooner barge that sank in 1907 that was full of coal, and we were able to do a test on that at least. And then we did a dive earlier this morning on the U-boat for the first time, so that was pretty exciting. So as we're uh, waiting for the action for the um, uh, ROV to be deployed, I thought I'd tell a little bit about the story of the sinking of the U-853 and basically the history of this Battle of Point Judith. So the U-853 was uh, one of uh, many German U-boats during during uh, World War II that were basically tasked with wreaking havoc on the American coast. So they were tasked with um, a mission to go and sink and destroy ships that um, were, were sailing along the U.S. Uh, East Coast. And what happened was uh, the U-853 was uh, given a patrol that went all the way from Halifax, Nova Scotia down to Virginia. 
And it actually did uh, sink a couple of ships, including a Navy ship in the Gulf of Maine. And then it was uh, continuing its patrol near the end of uh, World War II along the Rhode Island coast. And it uh, actually sent the Black Point. The SS Black Point was a coal carrier that was bringing coal up to Boston. And the, the Black Point was torpedoed by the U-853 on May 5, 1945. And it shot the, the um, aft end of the ship clean off. And it sank in a very short time. And 12 lives were lost when the Black Point sank. The Black Point is located only about four miles off the tip of Point Judith. And a Coast Guard um, uh, person who was working in the Coast Guard station uh, was monitoring the Black Point making its transit through Rhode Island Sound and heard the explosion actually and, and saw what happened. So word got out quite quickly that um, something bad had happened on the, on the seas and rescues needed to occur. And, uh, and then two ships, the Atherton and the Moberly, uh, were immediately sent out and because they heard the explosion and they knew the ship was sinking, they went out to see w what caused that, that, uh, that explosion and they suspected that it was a German U-boat and they um, did make sonar contact with the U-boat. So the, these ships, the Atherton and Moberly, were equipped with sonar technology to, back, to actually track down and hunt submarines. And so they were able to get sonar returns on the submarine, so they knew that they were listening to a submarine, a, in this case a U-boat. They weren't sure it, that it was uh, any particular U-boat, but they were suspicious that it was. And, uh, and they were actually able to um, make, make the sonar contact on it and drop a bunch of, bunch of depth charges on it and actually uh, what they think was uh, confirm a hit. And so they saw pieces of the ship float to the surface, but it was uh, confusing and this battle was ensuing and they weren't sure that they actually um, hit the, sh hit the um, U-boat or not. And so the next morning, a couple of airships went out, these blimps that were equipped with actually uh, rocket bombs and the blimps flew over the area and they actually reported an oil slick and they dropped some of their rocket bombs to just continue the attack to make sure that they um, destroyed the U-boat for sure and then another ship, a Navy destroyer, came out, the Ericsson, and it dropped its uh, depth charges on it so there must have been dozens of depth charge explosions and so you can only imagine what these sailors went through on the U-boat listening to these explosions and sure enough that morning a very large oil slick was, um, was found and then parts of the ship had floated up to the surface, so they knew they had uh, destroyed the U-boat. So that's really the story of the sinking of, of the U-853. Um, it was interesting because uh, they had just called a ceasefire a couple days before, and it's a mis mystery why the U-boat actually continued to attack. Maybe they didn't get the message that, that, um, that there was a ceasefire. And then they also did, there's another mystery about it, which is they didn't really run. Uh, after they um, shot their torpedo, they stayed in the area, which is strange. Normally they would have gotten out of there if they knew they were going to be under attack. But they just so, sort of sat and, and took it. So there's a lot of these mysteries around the sinking of the U-853. Now, it's net, so today the U-853 sits in about 120 meters water depth. Um, and we've just launched our ROV down, and we're, we're ho hopeful to see it uh, very soon. But it's also a popular scuba diving site. So scuba divers go down on the shipwreck often. It's a very dangerous dive. It's a deep dive. Some scuba divers have lost their lives actually diving on the shipwreck. And so it is a dangerous dive. Uh, so we're using technology that isn't dangerous to, to go down on the shipwreck. But um, uh, it is a very popular scuba diving target. And actually, uh, scuba divers have um, gone down on it for years and recovered a lot of artifacts from it, too. So one of the stories about this particular U-boat is that there was suspicion that it may have been carrying treasure. And so in the uh, early 60s, a lot of scuba divers went down looking for treasure on this ship. And, uh, and then throughout the 60s and 70s, a lot of artifacts were taken off the ship. The, propellers were actually removed from the ship and they are on display now at the Naval War College Museum in Newport, Rhode Island. So interesting story about the U-853, lots of history there, uh, little known history to many Rhode Islanders. And here we are on the RV Endeavor, diving an ROV, going onto the shipwreck now using this telepresence technology. So this technology enables us to have ship-to-shore telecommunications so we can basically be here and using our satellite system on the ship, broadcast video live, live to the Inner Space Center and then out to the Internet and out to Rhode Island PBS and other sites. Uh, we, we have two teachers on board, Shannon Donovan, uh, who you'll hear from later, and Tiffany Risch. And uh, Shannon actually did live broadcast to her classroom. She taught her class essentially from the ship during this week. So this telepresence technology is 
uh, very um, powerful for delivering live broadcasts that are educational about research that we, we're doing in, in oceanography. So we're going to introduce them now, but I'll give it back to you, Marie Elise. I actually have one question for you. We've had a few questions coming in on the chat, and it seems like people are confused by what inner space actually refers to. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, sure. So um, the Inner Space Center was a, a, a name of a facility, a term that was coined by Robert Ballard, actually, inner space. And what inner space is, is uh, what we refer to inner space as, is the deep ocean, the deep sea. Basically, a anything that's not outer space is inner space. So that where light does not penetrate, that beyond where scuba divers can go, the deep sea, which is always dark, is the inner space, as we call it. And so the Inner Space Center is an oceanographic facility that deals with technology for exploring the deepest parts of the ocean. So that's what we uh, refer to inner space as. Uh, it actually looks like we have another question come in on the chat. Yeah. Is Endeavor the only vessel that the Inner Space Center works with? Oh, good question. So no, we're, uh, we have a long history of working with other ships, including uh, the EV Nautilus, which is Dr. Robert Ballard's ship and the Ocean Exploration Trust's ship. And uh, they have a mission to explore the world's oceans. So we've been working with the EV Nautilus now for six years, and they continue to explore uh, uh, every year. And you can follow them on nautiluslive.org. And we also work with the Okeanos Explorer. It's a NOAA ship. NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and they manage a ship called the Okeanos Explorer. It's based in Quonset Point, Rhode Island, actually. So strong Rhode Island connections, strong URI connections to both of these ships. And that, their mission is uh, telepresence-enabled ocean exploration. So they use telepresence all the time. And the Inner Space Center was really able to support activities of those ships. So we're quite excited to have the Endeavor now part of that. It is URI's ship. And so the Endeavor now is equipped with the technology that the Nautilus and the Okeanos has. So we're very excited about that, having a third ship be part of uh, what we support at the Inner Space Center. And uh, this is the, the RV Endeavor is part of um, a system called UNALS, University National Oceanographic Laboratory System. And it's a fleet of about 20 or so research ships managed mostly by oceanographic institutions all around the country, including Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, et cetera. And the Endeavor has been operated by the University of Rhode Island now for almost 40 years. So uh, we hope to replace Endeavor soon and have this technology on board and the processes about supporting telepresence exploration is now part of Endeavor. So that's going to pave the way for the future. So we're pretty excited about that. I'm excited, too. Thank you so much for joining me, Dwight. Uh, now we're going to talk to two of the educators we have on board here, Shan Donovan from Situate High School and Tiffany Risch from Coventry High School. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Hi, um, my name is Shannon Donovan. I teach a variety of science classes at Situate High School in Rhode Island, and I have had one of the most amazing weeks of my life um, on the Endeavor here. Hey, and I'm Tiffany Risch. I teach predominantly physics and also oceanography at Coventry High School in Coventry, Rhode Island. And been, it's been a blast to be out here with Shannon, with the crew, with everyone that's working on this project um, to investigate this little piece of history, which is amazing. Well, so glad you're here with us. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this project? You want to go first? Sure. So I've been out to sea a few times with a few different organizations. Um, most recently, though, the last couple of years, working with Dr. Robert Ballard's, Ballard's Ocean Exploration Trust and the exploration vessel Nautilus. And now I became part of the Rhode Island Teacher at Sea program, which allowed me the opportunity to come out here on the Endeavor and do this research. So it's been a real experience in terms of kind of melding, or I should say meshing, many different types and facets of oceanography together. Um, and now seeing this archaeological experience, which is awesome, to the historical component. And I have been hearing stories from teachers like Tiffany and other colleagues about some of the great opportunities that exist for teachers to get involved in, in this type of a program to, to bring the actual research in the classroom. And, and so when I heard of this Rhode Island Teacher at Sea program um, opportunity, uh, I applied and, and did a little happy dance when I got accepted. So. <laughs> So tell us how you're going to bring your experience here back to the classroom. Well, there are so many different ways. Um, this year I am teaching uh, three different robotics classes, an environmental science class, and a biology class. So 
there are things that I have experienced this week uh, that, that apply to all of, all of those areas. Um, I can talk about the, the role of shipwreck, shipwrecks as artificial reefs in my biology and environmental science classes as they have an impact on biodiversity by creating these places where uh, organisms can adhere and grow and change the physical environment and therefore change the, the, the biological environment as well. Um, and so, so, so many opportunities to bring in what I've learned here to my robotics class. Um, and I've actually also tapped a, a few of the folks on the team here to come and visit with my students as well. So there's just so many ways that I can bring this into my classroom. Um, I've already had the chance to, to make a couple of short videos um, based on, on the experience here and, and already shared those with my students back home via our website. So it's amazing. And over the years, my students have been exposed to real research through programs like this, um, primarily through my videos, my pictures that I've taken, um, interactions with scientists online. And also, when I introduce new topics, especially in physics and oceanography, I'll access websites like nautiluslive.org, and there's a ton of pictures on there and videos that help explain some of the concepts, what, you know, what are we doing on board, how are we doing it, um, which can also be applied to here on the Endeavor, which is really neat to make that connection. Um, aside Aside from that, I'm just kind of looking forward to bringing this back to my students, and I need to talk to Shannon more about robotics because I would like to kind of make that a new component into different lessons at our high school. And the engineering is really awesome, especially with the next generation science standards and a heavy component based in engineering. Um, so to be able to see this, and I have tons of ideas in my head. I would love to collaborate with you. Yes. Okay. Um, she was my, my student once upon a time when I was a, a graduate student at URI. Uh, Tiffany, I was Tiffany's TA in, in botany. So we, we just keep uh, building our connections and, and running into each other in some exciting places. So I think we're meant to work together. <laughs> so we had a question come in on our live chat asking if there are high school programs available for robotics. There are a lot of programs. My uh, experience, I'm, I'm most familiar with the first program. They have, they have four levels of um, opportunities for students, the Junior Lego League, Lego League, uh, First Challenge, and First Robotics Challenge. Um, and I, at my school, we last year started doing the First Tech Challenge. And um, one of the tenets of First is this idea of gracious professionalism. And Alex and I talked about it at length this morning in a live broadcast. Um, it first, the first programs are great for character development on top of all of the other skills that, that students learn. And just some of the, the personal interactions we've witnessed here this week on, on the ship, I think, are great examples to students about what gracious professionalism really is and, and how teams, good teams, really work together. That's key, yeah. Good. good. <laughs> So, Shannon, I know this was your first time on a research vessel, and you were really excited about it. Is there anything about your experience here that has just blown you away? It's hard to pick just one thing. Um, when uh, the, the folks from the Coast Guard Academy were here with their smaller ROV, they actually let me drive it. It was the, the cadet, uh, Gabe Patterson, a cadet in the Coast Guard Academy and based out of New London, Connecticut. They had a, a smaller ROV than the one that you're seeing footage from right now. Um, and Gabe is a student leader of their robotics team back at school, and he taught me. To, to drive uh, and navigate uh, their, their ROV. So that is one of the huge highlights. Um, I, there's a picture on my Facebook page that Erin that took earlier tonight of, of me out on deck. I was minding the tether as we were recovering the ROV from an earlier dive, and we had a bunch of porpoises that were just being curious and all, swimming along, alongside the ship, and so she's got a picture of me with the tether line and the, the porpoises. So I, it's just there's so many things that are just amazing about this. Well, I'm so glad you had a great experience here. Uh, I also myself have had a great experience here. Um, I think that now we're going to move on to Mike Brennan and ask him a little bit about the history of U-853 and shipwrecks in general. So thank you both so much for joining us. We've really enjoyed having you here. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Mike Brennan is a marine archaeologist, and he works for the Ocean Exploration Trust. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. I'm Mike Brennan. Uh, I was a graduate student at GSO for uh, eight years, <laughs> long time, um, and I did my PhD in ethnography, and I'm now working for Ocean Exploration Trust as an expedition leader and director of marine archaeology for them. So I'm out here uh, representing the trust and also here as a project archaeologist for the U853. 
So let's talk shipwrecks. Yeah. So this shipwreck has been down there for about 70 years now. So what would you expect a shipwreck to look like after that amount of time? Sure. So um, there's obviously damage to the wreck that was caused by the sinking of so the depth charges that sank. The U-853 uh, caused a hole, I think, in the uh, forward uh, part of the hull. And so the, I know the divers have swam in there, and, and we I think we took a look at it earlier today. We saw a hole. I think it was from that. Um, we had poor visibility, so it's hard to, hard to tell exactly. Um, and so there's other things over time that affect a uh, steel hold shipwreck. Uh, so wooden shipwrecks will decompose the wood almost entirely, except what's covered by the sediment, because uh, wood boring organisms, there's these little mollusks called shipworms that aren't actually worms, but they eat the wood, and that'll make the, the wooden hulls disappear uh, quite rapidly. So with ancient shipwrecks, like the Romans and Greek ships, you're going to find just the cargo, so the ceramic amphoras, uh, which we tended to find quite often uh, off the coast of Turkey. Um, but over here, we didn't have ancient activity, so we have primarily wooden or steel-hulled ships uh, from historical times. And so the steel-hulled ships will corrode, um, as you know, most steel and iron does when it's underwater for eight uh, years or, or decades. Um, and so you start to see, like with the Titanic, for example, you start to see um, bacterial corrosion that um, was nicknamed rusticles. It's, it's like a uh, icicle of, uh, of rust. Um, and so you start, start to see that. You start to see the, the, the steel kind of disintegrating, becoming weaker over time. And you can even see some of the structures collapsing. Uh, you also get corals and sponges and other animals that uh, live on, on the wreck. And you have fish that start to um, colonize the wreck site. Um, so you, you do start to see um, kind of the integrity of the wreck starting to, to disintegrate. But it, uh, they last for quite a while. Um, they're good dive sites and, and good artificial reefs for uh, biology. So what about in the next 50 years? How will it change? Well, um, we have to kind of consider the life cycle of a shipwreck. I mean, so the life cycle of a ship starts when the ship's built and is used for its maiden voyage, and it ends when the ship sinks or is decommissioned, but in this case it sinks. Uh, and so you have to think about the life cycle of the shipwreck site as the moment it sinks until uh, it goes away. So in the case of the ancient shipwrecks that we were talking about off of Turkey um, that we looked at with Nautilus for many years, uh, th they will, you know, they'll stay forever because the ceramics are basically rocks and they'll stay forever, but they'll eventually be buried by sediment, um, you know, so they can't, can no longer be seen. We're talking, you know, probably centuries from now. Um, but steel hull wrecks will, you know, probably eventually uh, become... Uh, just a, a stain of rust on the on the sea floor. I mean, we're talking probably a, another century or two before that happens entirely. But um, steel is is difficult to preserve in, in a marine environment. Um, there's been talk about uh, painting the hull of the Titanic red with with kind of anti-fouling paint. Um, we haven't figured out a mechanism for um, actually applying that. Either it's a very concentrated spray can or a uh, uh, paintbrush, um, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think that it's it's a natural part of the uh, of a shipwreck of a shipwreck's life uh, is to eventually become uh, part of the seafloor. Uh, so we have another question that came in from our chat, and the question is, why can't you anchor near the wreck site? Oh well, actually we can. Um, so this this wreck is is shallow enough that we could anchor anchor near it, um, but because of potential hazards of dragging the anchor accidentally over the wreck site or disturbing it in some other way, we decided that live boating uh, was better. So we're using the ship and it's kind of uh, trying to maneuver itself to stay in the position over the wreck. Um, we have anchored with Nautilus over some of the ancient shipwrecks in the Black Sea uh, and and the Mediterranean. Sea. Uh, we've also live boated, and now that ship has dynamic positioning. Uh, this ship does not, but uh, the, the captain and the crew are doing a very good job holding us in position and getting us a, some good time on these wrecks. So I have a question about the artifacts. Are there certain artifacts inside that you would expect to be preserved and some that you would expect to disintegrate? Yeah, so um, anything that is uh, paper or cardboard or, or organic will disintegrate fairly rapidly. Um, I would expect any um, uh, plates or silverware that they had or ammunition and guns and that sort of thing uh, would still be there. Um, there have been quite a few artifacts uh, brought up from the site, including a gun. Um, I think uh, there was also a wallet that was brought up uh, that was pres uh, conserved by uh, archaeologists at the uh, Naval Historical Heritage 
Naval Historic and Heritage Command, um, and they did a good job preserving this wallet from uh, one of the sailors um, that had a, a prayer card in it, I believe. Um, so some some artifacts have been conserved from this wreck, um, and there, there's been quite a few others. So uh, again, anything organic is going to be gone, but anything uh, made of metal or rock or you know cer ceramic or something like that will still be there. So we had another question come in. Uh, can shipwrecks have any environmental impacts? Yeah, that's a really good question, especially with this site and, and other military uh, shipwreck sites. Uh, so you have oil and fuel that was in, the, in whatever tanks, was, and whatever's left in the tanks when it sank, if that wasn't ruptured during the sinking event. Um, you have unexploded munitions, so this wreck probably has a few torpedoes left. And uh, I know that there have been some depth charges found that weren't part of the submarine, but they were part of the battle that sank the submarine uh, when the Atherton was dropping depth charges onto the site to sink it. Uh, one of them didn't explode or possibly more than that and it's still sitting on the seabed i don't know if it's live or not but there is still um there is still some sort of uh, ordinance that's unexploded there so wrecks do pre uh, present an environmental hazard in some cases sometimes the corrosion of a, of, of the steel itself um can cause a, a, a phenomenon called black reef where that metal will actually um drift and and leach onto some coral reefs so like in the south pacific for example well, thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Uh, it's great to have your insight on the show. Thanks. So next, we're going to talk to Dwight Coleman again and just wrap up everything we've been doing here on this cruise. Well, we were hopeful to uh, be approaching the wreck of the U-853, but I think I mentioned on the top of the show that we have some of these challenges. One of the challenges is the current. And boy, we're having a really hard time right now uh, fighting against the current. It's quite swift. And uh, Jordan Kirby is our ROV pilot, and he's driving the ROV really as fast as he can, try to get up towards where the wreck is. And there's such a swift current kind of pushing him to the south that uh, he's he's doing giving it all he's got to, to kind of get, get up there. And uh, it's taking a while. So this is one of the challenges that we have when we're operating in these conditions. Um, Typically, we don't use ROV technology to dive on shipwrecks that are this shallow and that are in environments that have very swift currents like this. Uh, with the Nautilus program and the Okeanos Explorer program, uh, we use very deep diving shipwrecks that are probably um, easily 10 times, uh, deep diving ROVs that are easily 10 times the size of this ROV that we're using right here. So these are heavy instruments. This ROV weighs about uh, 200 pounds and uh, Hercules weighs about 5,000 pounds, so much larger vehicle system, meant for deep water uh, environments. And so, you know, we're learning as we go here. This is uh, one of the challenges with operating technology. Um, we're safe, of course. We're not using scuba gear. There's no humans in the water right now. Uh, so this is a bit of an experiment to see if we could use this robotic technology to kind of keep things um, keep things going. And we're, we're struggling a bit. And Okay, uh, because this is all part of science, it's all part of ocean exploration, to see what technology is good for different projects, and uh, perhaps this isn't the best uh, technology to use to explore the U-boats, unfortunately, but we're doing our best. So uh, I'll give it to you. So before we run out of time, uh, I'd like to ask you about any projects we have in the future. Sure. So the Inner Space Center continues to support, like we mentioned, the Okeanos Explorer and uh, the, the uh, EV Nautilus. So their seasons are actually uh, winding down now, too. Most of the ships that we work with uh, work in the Northern Hemisphere. So generally our field season is, starts around uh, March, April, May. Uh, in this particular season, um, we did a lot of work in the Gulf of Mexico and in the Caribbean. And then Nautilus went through the Panama Can Canal and up at, uh, into the Pacific Ocean. So it's working off of uh, Canada right now. And um, they're going to end the season in Canada uh, in about a month. And then we're hopeful to start the season early next year in, in Canada and actually work, then start working our way south. So um, next season looks to be a pretty busy year with the EV Nautilus. The Honest Explorer is exploring right now off of Hawaii, and they're going to be wintering over in Hawaii. So they're going to be wrapping up their field season, I think, around uh, the early part of October. And then they're going to stand down for a few months. They have a lot of maintenance to do and shipyard work to do. And then they're going to start their season in Hawaii after, uh, sometime after January 1st. So we'll continue to support uh, both ships and uh, uh, hopefully more UNOL ships. Uh, there's some talk of us doing work with the Endeavor, possibly in collaboration with Cuba. Uh, so this may be something that comes up uh, next year, we're hopeful for. So we'll see. These are the projects we're working on.
back to you. Well, thank you so much. This concludes our final scheduled show from the Endeavor. But I'd like to encourage you to watch online. We're still going to continue to stream, and hopefully we will be at the rec site soon. Thanks so much for joining us, and continue to explore with us.